Miss Sue for reading that very interesting passage. And you'd think that on a day like today, at a baptism service, we would talk about Jesus uh, welcoming children. Or at a confirmation service, we talk about the importance of faith. And those would be fantastic topics to preach on, on a day like today. So why Daniel 8? And this weird vision with uh, rams and shaggy goats and horns coming out from everywhere. Why pick that for today? Well, at Christchurch Cascades, we believe that God has spoken uh, in His Word, the Bible, and that He sets things in a certain way. So we believe that God gave Daniel this book, and it has one message. And so we work through this message uh, week by week. To see what God said and why he said it at that point in time and in that context. And we got today to Daniel chapter 8. And as I've prepared on it this week, it's actually, I think, a passage that's really quite applicable and appropriate for Leon and Laurel as they raise Eli. And for the rest of us who have or might have kids. It's appropriate for all of us who, like Brad are going to look today and in the future to navigating the world as one of God's people. And, on top of that, it is one of only two chapters in the entire Bible in which Eli's brothers Gabriel and Daniel are mentioned in one chapter. So, perfect, isn't it? I thought that that was good. We're going to take my usual approach. Three points. I'm just going to break stuff as I go. Uh, Three points. The first point we're going to look at is just we're going to Kind of look at what this vision is about, um, talk through it and explain it. Secondly, we'll consider why God wanted His people to know this vision. And then thirdly, we'll just look at one or two other things that I think are helpful for us as people in Peter Maritzburg today. So number one, the dream came to pass. Uh, So Daniel, in his vision, he stands in the city of Susa. It's on the eastern side of the kingdom of Babylon. It's at the time when Babylon is still the reigning empire. And he's given a a vision of the future. We are told in verse 20 that the ram uh, represents the kings of the Medes and the Persians. This was a kingdom which grew to great strength for 200 years between 550 BC and 330 BC. I think I have a map of it in the if we're like here. So you can see how massive it was. It was, as Gabriel said, great. The goat, which comes racing through from the west, you can actually see where it is, I'm just going back to that back, sorry, is um, Greece, and it's Alexander the Great, who comes from Macedonia. He's the one horn in the middle. He comes from Macedonia. If you know, if you've ever watched Alexander, he just sweeps through the known world at the time, conquering Persia, conquering every kingdom out there. In the space of 12 years, by the age of 32, He rules all of that, plus more. He ruled pretty much everything there was to rule at the time. Sure, guys. Is it a coffee day today? eh? (coughs) Who needs water? Um, What happens then in the vision is the the one horn that represents Alexander. It breaks. He dies. When he dies, four of his mates take over the kingdom, and they divide it into four. In a few hundred years, one of those, it's called the Seleucid Empire. It gives rise to a king. He's represented by the little horn. Now this king is a dude called Antiochus IV. Uh, That's a a bust of him. Obviously hasn't survived so well. Um, Antiochus, he gave himself the name Theos Antiochus Epiphanes. Translated means the illustrious god Antiochus. No self-esteem issues, that guy. Now, in Daniel's vision, this uh, little horn that represents Antiochus, he sees him rise up against the heavens. He attacks God. He does so through attacks on his people. And we read that the horn revokes the regular sacrifice. It throws truth to the ground. Throughout that vision, I don't know if you saw, as Sue was reading it, there's this language of it trampling everything and everyone underfoot. This guy is mean. And we know from history that Antiochus had a special hatred of the Jews. Uh, He did stop the sacrifices in the temple on two occasions. Twice he oversaw mass slaughter of 40,000 odd Jews in Jerusalem. Um, In fact, he lost a battle against the king of Egypt. He was convinced that it was the Jews' fault that they had betrayed him. And so he came back to Jerusalem, killed 40,000 people... He allowed uh, ritual prostitution within the temple of God in Jerusalem. Put up a statue of Zeus 
in the courtyard and he sacrificed a pig which was an unclean animal to the Jews on the Holy of Holies. So Antiochus desecrated God's house. He shook his fist at God, at his home and at his people. The reality that Daniel foresaw was as bad as he thought it would be in the dream. When he woke up, I don't know if you remember the end of the chapter, he lay sick for days. The reality of this dream was as bad as the dream. That's our summary. Now for those of you who know me, you know I love me some history, and you'd be proud to see how short this was, right? Um, This was for you visitors, because man, I can go on and on about history if I want to. So this vision actually came true. This is real stuff. So the second thing we come to then is, we come to the question, why does God want his people to know this? But before we answer that, I, wanted, I wondered if you were thinking a question as you thought about the vision and as you thought about the explanation that Daniel got. Why a vision like this? If it's about the future, could God not just have said to Daniel, Daniel... The Babylonians are in charge right now. The Medes and the Persians are going to come. They're going to take over. Then the Greeks are going to take over. And one of them is going to be nasty. And and you're going to live in a horrible time. That's quite short, right? That's that's less than this chapter. Why does God do do a vision and not just tell him what's going to come? It's, It's a bit like music in a movie. So picture, picture uh, uh, the ocean. In the ocean is a young couple. It's late afternoon. They run down the beach. They jump in the water and they're swimming. No sound to this. Just a picture. Lovely, eh? They're swimming in the ocean. Fantastic. But now, picture that same picture. You got it in your head. Two people in the ocean. Picture that picture. No, no, no. Picture that movie with this in the background. What does that music do? It makes you realize something is not good. Something is not right. And as you watch that that scene, you know there's Jaws. And Jaws is coming up. Music helps you feel the tension. Now, Daniel is not writing music for us here. And God is not giving him music, he is giving him a vision and the picture of a ram and a picture of a shaggy goat. Oh, come storming from the west. That's meant to help Daniel and meant to help us see something of the terror and the horror and the things that are going to happen so that the vision becomes more gut wrenching and visceral to us and to Daniel. And it freaks Daniel out. Look at the end of of the chapter. He's overcome and he's sick. He remains disturbed by the vision. The imagery adds drama. The imagery brings home how terrible the reality is that's going to come. That's why God uses these visions. Now why did God's people need to know this? Could they not just have blithely remained unaware? This is a vision of their future. It's a vision about the world, it's a vision about kingdoms and politics, it's a vision of how God's people fit into all of this. God is them giving them a glimpse into their future by giving them a glimpse into the future. And here are a few things that he is showing them. He's showing them firstly that the future is not all sunshine and roses. There are going to be big political and global events that are going to, that are going to shape the world in which they live. The world in which they... And and, and these are things that they can do nothing about. It's bigger than them. These events will come about and will make life difficult for them. And at the very least, they are to be ready to live in turbulent times. Think about it for the moment. If the Western world that we inhabit were to come to an end immediately, you just have to watch uh, some apocalyptic TV show to kind of get the idea of what happens. It won't just be a propositional fact for you or for me. You know, what if tomorrow we wake up and there's no more electricity? Oh, 
electricity. <laughs> There's no more running water, there's no more government, there's no more electricity, there's no more internet, there's no more telecommunications, you can't fly and visit your family overseas, you're isolated, nothing works, and you're left to fend for yourself. That is a terrifying prospect. And so it was for them. They're frightened. And so, for the Jews of Daniel's day, who at the time, remember, they're in exile, they want to go back to Judea, it's a reminder that a lot of things are going to happen before the world is put right. Before they are home, and more than that, before home is lovely. Before home is like a beautiful, broad <coughs> meadow. Now that's my little break. I'm using broad meadow because it's a lovely vision, but also because I mentioned Gabriel and Daniel in the chapter, Elijah's brothers, and Bradley, the name, means broad meadow. There you go. Got you in there too, Brad. <laughs> And it's a, a lovely description of peaceful. But, but what, what God is showing Daniel and the Jews and God's people throughout the ages is that they're going to live in turbulent times. But third thing, God is aware of this. How else could he give a vision of the future if he didn't know about this? And I think that this is something that is and should be a comfort to God's people through the ages. He knows what we will face. He knows what is coming. And sure, he might not give all the detail and predict every decision you might have to make and every outcome that will come, but he knows what is going on. Nothing takes God by surprise. Even, fourthly, the evil stuff. So this vision Daniel sees is a terrible one. The reality that it foretold was as terrible as that. God lets us know here that He is aware of that. He sees it, and it's never out of His control. In verse 24, we read that the power of this ruthless king will be great, but it will not be His own. He doesn't have this power that He wields by Himself that is outside of the realm and the control of God. The questions that we might have of why evil, why is there evil, they, they've never been easy to answer. We're not always told everything in every situation either. But in this case, in this case here, the king, Antiochus, is held responsible for all his own evil. He is the one who is ruthless, he's skilled in intrigue, he's the one who destroys, he's actively doing these things, and that is the case with much evil in our world. People do it. And there could be several reasons why God would allow this to happen. We're not told here what they are. So what we need to do in this passage as with any other is we need to see what are we told. What are we told? Here we're told that God restrains evil. God holds it back. Look at verse 25. Um, he will stand against the Prince of Princes, look at the end there, yet he will be broken, not by human hands. God would bring Antiochus to an end. He might use human means, but God would do it. We know that ultimately God will bring all evil to an end. In the New Testament, there's another book that has all these visions, the book of Revelation. And that book we read how God will ultimately end evil, he will end those who cause it, and He will end, gloriously, the effects of evil. Tears, sadness, death. Those things will be done away with. There will be judgment for all of evil. There will be the removal of evil itself. This is the hope that every Christian holds on to. We said it earlier in the Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That life is the future that Jesus bought for us with His death and His resurrection. It is a future that is without evil. This is the future that Leon and Laurel are committing today to teaching to Elijah as they do with Gabriel and Daniel. Because while Daniel's vision here speaks of Persia and Greece, and the things happened before the time of Jesus, we can still learn from this. Because Daniel has been shown the global stage on which he and the Jews of his day live. But we live in that same global stage, right? 
We live in a world where empires rise and fall, where conquest happens, where a, a type of government can last for 200 odd years and then just disappear. And the reality is that change is difficult. It shakes all of the world in which we live. In fact, when, when Rome fell uh, and the Western Roman Empire came to an end, the Christians were so distraught by that, they thought Jesus was coming back. Because the end of Rome, surely that is the end of the world. These things shake us. Daniel was shown this vision, and it's saved for you and I, because God wants us to be aware of what the big picture is. Powers will rise and fall. When I was a kid, the Soviet Union was a big thing. It doesn't exist anymore. The USA, China, they'll go the way of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, and the Byzantine Empire. World powers will change. What we do, what do we do with this instability and this uncertainty is what Daniel was told to do, or what Daniel did. We see it. We recognize that it is scary because change on a large scale like this is frightening, but we do two things. Number one, we trust the unchanging God. More on that next week. Number two, look at verse 27. Daniel, I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for days. What does he do then? I got up and went about the king's business. He kept on living life as a believer, though he could not understand everything, and it still sat in his gut. I think we saw something similar in 1 Peter in our growth groups where Peter writes to Christians who might be being persecuted for their faith. He said, he said this. It's not there. Oh, okay, there it is. So, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. If you're a Christian here today, visions of the world on larger scales in the Bible, like we've got today, are generally there to help believers to persevere even when life becomes difficult. And I think that we today, and I don't know if it's been like this for the last 100 or 200 years, I'm not sure, but, but we let global events cause anxiety. And just think about COVID and everyone's responses to it. There was just mass anxiety. And social media... Uh, and the mass hysteria that it fosters, the YouTube video that, like, what world powers don't want you to know, what the mass media don't want you to know, what blah 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 doesn't want you to know, what does that do to us? It makes us nervous, it makes us anxious, it makes us fearful. Because when we know the future is scary, or even when we don't know what the future holds, the temptation for you and I and for everybody is that we live in fear. Daniel, while afraid of the future, did not let fear stop him from getting on with living faithfully for God. Why do we let fear stop us? Why do we focus so much on conspiracy theories and all that junk, and less on loving our neighbor, loving God, and telling people that, yes, things are scary, there is a glorious future, that can be yours if you trust in Jesus. That is the point of these visions for the future. It is going to be difficult, says Daniel. God is in control. Get on with what matters. I'm always struck. It's one of the, the passages that, that really gets to my heart in the New Testament. It's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night before the crucifixion. The night before his death, and he goes into the garden with three of his disciples coming with him, and he says, please pray with me because I am so anxious. And three times he goes and he prays to the Father, and he says, Father, if there is any way in which we can rescue people from their sin, any way that is not going to be me on the cross, separated from you for that time, Bearing the weight of all the wickedness of the world on my shoulder. If there's any way we can do this, please help me do it. 
Three times he prayed that. He, he was so anxious he sweated blood. Three times. And at the end he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. There wasn't another way. What did Jesus do? He got up. He faced the temple guard there to arrest him. And he went to his death. He got on with things. And he did so. So that you and I, if we followed after him, if we trusted him, could get on with life in the knowledge that in the midst of massive social and political upheaval, in the midst of private personal upheaval, moving cities, going new places, all that kind of stuff, our future is guaranteed and our future is glorious. And the glorious certainty of that is yours if you trust in Christ. And I'm not talking here about this a cursory acceptance that this is true historically. Or yes, I really love the moral values of Christianity. It's a trust that what he did, he did for you. That what he says is what you do. And what he promises is what you hold on to. That can be yours today. So that you too can stand up and like Leon and Laurel, like Brad, confess what Jesus has done for you. Because he humbled himself. And he got on with doing what was needed for you and I. I want to finish with just a few little things that this passage fleshes out for us. And it's to do a bit with evil and Antiochus. And I think it helps us to, as we look on how we're going to get on with living the Christian life. The first thing is that sometimes evil and evil people will prosper. It's the kind of thing that blows our minds. It doesn't make sense why this happens. And if you want to go read Psalm 73, it's what the author there wrestles with. As he, as he just wonders why it is that good people sometimes suffer and evil people do well. God encourages us as His people to trust Him even in those times. Because as we see in Daniel 8, evil has an expiry date. The second thing is slightly less comfortable. As if the first one was comfortable. Um, evil lurks in every single one of us. The story of Antiochus Epiphanes is a story of a, a madman. In fact, his nickname from some was Antiochus Epimenes. It's the Greek kind of jokes there, dad jokes for the Greeks. Antiochus Epimenes means Antiochus the madman. No one said it to his face. His evil stems from, if you look at verse 25, exalting himself. In his own mind he will exalt himself. The nature of what the Bible calls sin is that we seek to be independent of God. We seek to stand on our own two feet and say to Him, thank you, I've got this from here. Sometimes that becomes a shaking of the fist like Antiochus and just going all out to make life as difficult as we can for everyone. For most of us, I dare say, sitting here, it's just that we don't think about God. Just gone as if he's not there. And we say, I will do this myself. We exalt ourselves to the position of God. I'm in charge of my own And that is the same root as Antiochus. Be aware, friends. Just because you are a nice person does not mean you are right with God. What makes you right with Him is trusting submission. As we mentioned just now, it is uh, the word you want to use is repentance. It's turning from your own rule. You know, if you think about your life and you're going this way, you say, I'm in charge of my life. I'm doing what I want to do. Repentance is saying, actually, no, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to turn and I'm going to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to say what you tell me to say. I'm going to follow after you. That is saving faith. So lastly then, for those of us who do trust in Jesus, I want us to go back to 1 Peter in chapter 5. 
Peter writes, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Do not be afraid. Submit to the mighty God who cares for you. And in the midst of, of trying times, whether they personal or massive scale like Daniel 8, humble yourself before God. Trust Him. And, and Peter says, be, be sober-minded. In other words, and that I think is the way in which we get on with life. In other words, you know the danger. Know the evil that might lurk. The way in which the devil might tempt you, whether he tempts you to fear and stop trusting God, or whether he tempts you to take matters into your own hand and say, I'm not sure that you've got this under control, God. Let me just do my own thing here quickly, and I'll sort myself out. Know yourself. Know where you can be tempted. Be sober-minded, knowing all the while that exaltation awaits, even if now perhaps you are to struggle. What would you do if you knew that tomorrow was your last day, tomorrow at midday, Christ was coming back, or your life was to end. <coughs> Daniel might say to you, <coughs> Peter might say to you, take out your calendar, get on with living the life that God has given you to live. Humble yourself before Him. Resist the devil. Love your neighbor. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Brad, of the difficulties that might come. Don't be afraid, Leon and Laurel, though parenting has its many, 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 many challenges. Because God doesn't just know the future. But as Jesus says, I am with you to the end of the age. God doesn't just know the future. He walks alongside us through the present. Let me pray for us. Father, we sang earlier that stars will rise, stars will fade and mountains fall, but Christ will shine forever, love's unfading splendor. And if stars will fade and mountains fall, how much more human kingdoms and rules, how much more the, the world in which we live would be changeable like Daniel's was we pray that today that today you will help us to see that not only are you still sovereign that nothing takes you by surprise but that you care for us you care enough to end evil and you care enough to walk alongside us as we walk through this world and we pray that you would do that whether we have trusted in you today or whether we have trusted you for many years, keep walking alongside us. Help us to stand firm, be sober-minded and keep our eyes fixed on Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.